Hey guys, here is a haul of P3 for AQA. There is a lot of maths in physics. There's no way we can get away from this. Physics could be described as maths with a lot of words in and a few graphs. So we need to be really, really good at our maths. And these are the rules that I get my students to follow when we are talking maths questions. First of all, get your magic physics pen. Now my students laugh at me, but this is what I call it. So get a colored pen, get a highlighter, get a different color pen to the one you're writing in. Circle all of the numbers that you can see in the question. Use the units to work out what these numbers mean. Get your formula sheet, find an equation with all of these bits on, write down the formula. Now, this is generally, unless they give it to you, going to be your first mark. Write the numbers under the formula in the right place, do the maths, because that's generally only worth one mark, and then add the units. So even if you've forgotten your calculator, you can still get loads and loads of marks by doing all of these things. Now, units are so, so important. You have to learn these. Um, there's just no way we can get around this. For any of the maths bits that you need help with, pop over to my website and look at the books that I've got there. Loads and loads of stuff to help you with the maths and physics. You're also going to need to be confident in your standard form, your significant figures, and you are going to be confident in your rounding because these are the sort of things that are really, really likely to come up in the exam as extra little bits, but might not be something you spent too much time on in your physics lessons. My website has loads of resources to help you with this. If we want to look at broken bones, we can use x-ray. So with x-ray, the soft tissue um, is going to allow anything to go straight through, whereas a hard tissue like bone is going to stop stuff going through. So what we're going to see on the x-ray image is it's going to be black where loads and loads of x-rays have gone through and white where no x-rays have been allowed to go through. And this is going to give us our image. X-rays are also used in a CT scanner, but a CT scanner can go round. So we are going to get a much more detailed, much more in-depth picture of what's going on. And then it's going to send all of the information to a computer. So you're going to get a much better um, 3D image than you would get otherwise. Um, a CT scanner can also distinguish between different types of soft tissue. It gives a higher dose of radiation and it costs more, but we are going to get a lot better diagnostic image doing this. Here is my ultrasound image. It is a very, very poor ultrasound image. Um, ultrasounds do not give amazingly good pictures, but they can be used um, to see things that are going on. And this is much more about looking at soft tissue and what's going on inside. Now, one of the reasons ultrasounds are used for prenatal scannings is because they don't, they're, they're not that dangerous. They're pretty much, they're a lot safer to use than um, x-rays because they're non-ionizing. And as I said, they can be used um, for scanning babies or they can be used for treating kidney stones. And the way ultrasound work is that it sends um, the ultrasound through and then it bounces back at different points. And this is what they can use to work out um, what's going on inside. Now, if you're asked a question about ultrasound and maybe asked to work out the difference distance, the really, really important thing to remember, it is there and back again. So you have to half the time that it takes because the distance is only going to be in one direction. If you're calculating the distance there and back again, you'd need the whole time. But since you only want the distance from one place to another place, you're going to need to half it. 
when light enters a different medium, so when it's going from um, air into water or into plastic or into glass, it's going to change speed. And changing speed means it changes direction, and this is refraction. Now, each object has its own refractive index, and we can work that out by taking the sine of the angle of incidence and dividing it by the sine of the angle of refraction. Now, if you want to work out the critical angle, that is the angle where something is completely internally reflected, then we can just do 1 over the sine of the critical angle. We can work out N from sine of R and the sine of I, but if you're asked to work out an angle, what you're going to need to do here is the inverse sine on your calculator. Endoscopes rely on visual light, and here we have the light going in and it is going to be totally internally reflected which means it's going to come down here and then go back up again and always remember to draw arrows to indicate the direction of the light and then come back out again. So somebody can send um, an endoscope down uh, someone's esophagus to look at the stomach, to look at the various different internal organs and then while that's in there and they can send a laser down there, which they can use to um, burn away things, they can destroy tissue, they can be used to cauterize um, leaking blood vessels. Um, so lots and lots of really interesting medical applications from endoscopes. Two types of lenses you need to know about are convex and concave or converging and diverging. Convex or converging lenses can be used to treat long-sightedness and con concave or diverging lenses can be used to treat short-sightedness. Ray diagrams can seem really, really scary, but they're not as long as you just follow a few simple rules. Now, obviously, you're going to be doing this with a pencil and a ruler, but I don't have a pencil and a ruler, so I'm just going to do this freehand. Here is my object over here, and I've chosen a complicated one because it is not sitting on the axis. What you need to do is draw a line from the top of the object to the image, and this is a converging lens. You can tell that because of the arrows at the top and the bottom here. Then it needs to go from that point through, oops, through the focal point and down. Then you need to go from the top of the lens, oh dear, through the point where it crosses over and down. And these two points where it cross, this is going to be the top of the image because our lines are drawn from the top of the image. Now we need to do the same but from the bottom of the image. So line going across to the um, lens through the focal point. Then we need to have our line going um, from the bottom of our image through the point where it crosses over. And this here is going to be the bottom of our image. Because um, the lines came from the bottom of the image. Now, mine is ever so slightly offset. That's because I've drawn it freehand. That's very, very bad of me. But this is what your image is going to look like. And you'll notice it is inverted. It's a real image and it is smaller than the original image. If um, my object was placed here, um, this would turn the converging lens into a magnifying lens. Um, follow the state, same rules but then you'd need to um, draw your lines going down here but you'd need to backtrack them up here because this is where your image would be. It would be virtual, it would be upright, and it would be larger. So that's how you take um, a normal converging lens diagram and turn it into a magnifying diagram. But that will only happen if the object is placed between the lens and the focal point. Here we're going to do the same but for a diverging lens. And it's this focal point here that we are interested in. So follow the same rules. You need to go across and then from this focal point, you need to track the image and go back outwards. So I'm going to do this in dashed lines 
and then go up and then you need to do the same for the top um, of the image so we need to go here straight through the focal point there and what you're going to end up with is our tiny little image in here like this um, this is going to be virtual it is going to be upright and it is going to be smaller diverging lenses are much simpler than converging lenses Magnification calculations tend to catch people out because they think they're more complicated than they actually are. All you need to do is measure the image height and divide it by the object height. Now, in the example, they may give you a scale or you may just have to use your ruler for this and there are no units for magnification. Eyes and cameras actually have quite a lot in common and you need to know all of these. So, uh, a camera is going to have a variable focus. And a camera is actually going to have a fixed focus. It's going to have potentially lots of different fixed focus, but um, it is going to be fixed. They both are going to have converging lenses. Um, the focusing adjustment is going to be... Um, by the position of the lens and in the eye it's going to be by the ciliary muscles. Um, the image in both of them is going to be real and inverted. Um, and the image detection in the eye is going to be in the retina, where it was on the camera, it's going to be on a photographic film, or more commonly these days, a CCD display in a digital camera. So here is um, an image from the first YouTube video I ever made, which was all about the eye. Um, things have got quite a lot more advanced since then. So right at the back over here we have the retina. This is where the uh, image is formed. Down here we have the blind spots. This bit here is the optical nerve. Um, moving over to this side, um, here we have the ciliary muscles. And then the green bits holding the um, lens up is going to be suspensory ligaments. The bit in the middle here, this is the lens. Um, the gap that we can see in front of that is the pupil. And then all the way around the um, outside we have the cornea. And then the coloured bit um, that we can actually see is the iris. Another equation where people get caught out because lens power is measured in diopters, which is a D. Focal length is measured in metres and to work them out we should do 1 divided by focal length. One of the best presents my parents ever gave me um, was when I got my first flat and they got me a complete set of spanners and a complete set of screwdrivers because you actually need a surprising amount of spanners and screwdrivers to be able to do DRO properly. Now one of the really really good thing about um, spanners or levers is that um, if you want to increase the amount of force you are putting into something, you don't actually need to try harder, you just need to get a longer spanner. Um, so teeny tiny little spanners, while maybe quite cute, are actually quite useless. What you need is a set of really, really big spanners. 
Now the reason you need a set of really, really big spanners is because the moment is equal to the force times the distance. Distance is measured in meters, force is measured in um, newtons, and the moment is measured in newton meters. One of the best topics that could come up in your exam is a question about centre of mass or a question about stability because that's so, so lovely. Um, so if you want to make something more stable, there are two things you can do. You can have a lower centre of mass or you can have a wide base. Now, if you want to find the centre of mass of an irregularly shaped object, what you need to do is to um, get something to hang it off, like a clamp stand. You need to have what we call a plumb line, which is just um, a bit of string with a small weight on the end. You need to hang your irregular shape off there through a hole and you need to draw a dotted line exactly down where the plumb line will hang. You need to do that again and what you will end up with is two dotted lines um, going through your object and where they meet that is going to be the centre of mass. If you want to check that you can actually fold along the centre of mass and you should be able to balance it on the end of a pencil. When we're looking at moments in balance, um, we need to have the clockwise equal to the anticlockwise if we are going to get something balanced. And this is how we work it out. So we have the anticlockwise moment is going to be um, due to the things going anticlockwise. So we need to take into account the weight which is measured in newtons, and we need to take into account the distance. And again, on the other side, the weight and the distance. And distance is measured in meters. Now, they may give you weight and distance for the anti-clockwise, and they may give you one of them for the clockwise and ask you to work out the other one. Now, one has to equal the other. So this may seem like a really, really complicated question, but all you need to do is just do the same equation several times. When we're talking about hydraulics, we have, I'm afraid, yet another P in here for you to remember. But this P this time is for pressure. Then we have force and we have area. Now pressure is measured in pascals which is PA, force is measured in newtons, and area is measured in meters squared. Now, sometimes in the exam, they may ask you to give the answer in newtons per centimeter squared. Just give the answer in newtons per centimeter squared, but you need to be really, really careful um, with your units here. Are they giving you a unit in, are they giving you a value in meter squared, or are they giving you a value in centimeter squared? You need to be really, really careful about this. Now, the reason this equation is important in hydraulics is because the hydraulic system is full of a liquid, and a liquid is incompressible. This is a word the examiners love. So if we have pressure equals force over area at this side, we can work out, um, if we have the force and we have the area, we can work out the pressure in the system, which means we can apply pressure equals force over area to this side to either work out the force or the area. So again, this can be a really, really complicated question, but it's actually a very simple equation just used several times.
circular motion is a really tricky concept and the problem is we don't have a lot of time in class to you know really really do this justice if you really want to understand it it does involve quite a lot of thinking what we have here is um, an object that is attached to a center and this object is moving around but at any given point what it wants to be doing is going straight on. So the entire time it is going at the same speed but changing direction. And because it is changing direction it is accelerating. Because if something is going um, in the same same speed, in the same direction, it's not accelerating. But if either the speed or the direction change, it is accelerating. So, tricky thing to get your head around, but same speed, due to the change in direction, that means it's accelerating. And it's accelerating towards the centre of the circle. I know this is really, really complicated. Now, the centripetal force that is going to be applied on this is going to depend on a couple of things. It is going to depend on its mass, it is going to depend on speed, and it is going to depend on the radius of the circle. Here we have another equation. We have the time period equals 1 over the frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz, time period is measured in seconds, and a time period is there and back again. That is one swing of the pendulum, there and back again. Around all magnets, there is going to be a magnetic field, and this is going to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. And we can use this in physics for some really, really interesting and exciting applications. Now an electromagnet can be used um, in a number of different ways. It can be used in a crane or a circuit breaker or a bell like a fire alarm or it can be used in a relay. And what happens, we have our current going in here. Now this little bit of current will turn this coil into a magnet, so that will turn our electromagnet on. This part of the iron arm will be attracted down towards the magnet, which will kick this part of the leg up, and it will close the gap, turning on the switch. Now, sometimes, like in a fire alarm, this turning, this closing the gap will actually stop this circuit down here, which means the electromagnet is no longer on, which means the iron arm will no longer be attracted, which means the pivot the leg will no longer be connecting the gap, which means this can no longer turn the current off, which will mean the current turns on. And then you get this constant on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, which is where something like um, the fire alarm or your school bell is going to be constantly ringing for a long period of time. Fleming's left hand rule can seem pretty complicated. Now what I want you to do with your hand is hold it in this configuration over here. And you're going to need to adjust your hand to wrist, turn your wrist around so we can get things lined up. Because what we need is your first finger, so this one here, is going to be the field. That's the magnetic field. We need your second finger, this one here pointing down. This is going to be the current and then your thumb over here is going to be the force. So what we get if we make our hand now and line it up with um, the, the picture that I've drawn over my left hand side, we should have our first finger pointing this way because this is our field. We should have our second finger pointing down because this is our current and you should have your thumb pointing at you and that is going to be the direction of the force. This is complicated but with practice it's not that tricky to do in an exam.
This is a step down transformer. We can tell because the primary coils, there are lots of them, and then the secondary coils, there aren't very many of them. In a step up transformer, this would be reversed. Now, a step down transformer reduces the potential difference as we go across it. And this is really, really important for safety. So here we have the potential difference. across the primary and potential difference is measured in volts over the potential difference across the secondary measured in volts equals the number of coils Um, in the primary, and this is just a number divided by the number of coils. And again, this is just a number. Here we have the potential difference. In the primary times the current across the primary coils is equal to the potential difference in the secondary times the current in the secondary. Current is measured in amps and potential difference is measured in volts. So well done guys, you've made it to the end of this revision video. If you've managed to make it this far, you're doing excellent, excellent work. You're all working so, so hard. I'm so proud of you and you're all little stars.